Time for rocket science! Today I'm going to tell you about rocket science just like Johnny Cash built Cadillacs, one piece at a time, in a way that you can understand without using big words and without talking over your head. Let's get started. The first and most important lesson that you need to understand in rocket science is where the center of gravity is versus where the center of drag is and how that matters to rockets. The best way to explain most of this is with examples so that you can actually see what's going on. And our first example is a lawn dart. All the weight is at the front, all the drag is at the back. So your balance point for this thing is really far forward and your center of drag, or if you held it and blew on it from the side, the point at which it wouldn't spin around but it would just sit sideways is really far at the back. That's why when you throw a lawn dart, almost no matter what, it points the direction it's traveling. Because all of the drag is at the back and all of the weight carrying it forward is at the front. Right? Just like a wind vane. That's why a wind vane wants to point into the wind. Except for there being a balance point, there's just a pivot point, a physical pivot point, that it turns on. So you want the rocket to fly straight forward. So the further the center of gravity is in front of the center of drag, the more stable the flight is of the rocket. Now you can tell that that's pretty far back. So I'm going to turn this fan on here and I'm going to hold the pencil and it's going to blow a bunch of air on it and I'll hold it sideways and we'll see if it turns into the air or if it turns away from the air. All right, I have a washer on the pencil so that I can't cheat. We're going to see if this turns into the flow of the air, which would say that the point of drag is behind the center of gravity, which means it would fly correctly when it's shooting through the air. There, see? So the point of drag is behind the center of gravity on this rocket. Just to drive the point home, imagine a pointy rock with a feather attached to the back of it flying through the air. Obviously, it's going to point the direction that it's traveling. Now also, if you're building model rockets, there's a super, super easy way to test this. You just hang a model rocket from a string, and when it's balanced and it stays level, then you swing it around, and the air that moves around the rocket will cause it to fly either in the direction that it's traveling or it'll make it turn around and then you know for sure whether your point of drag is behind your center of gravity. Now if you're thinking that a rocket is different from a lawn dart because it has thrust coming out of the back of it, that is called the rocket pendulum fallacy, right? Or the pendulum rocket fallacy. The pendulum rocket fallacy comes from Robert Goddard, one of the first rocket scientists. He thought that if you put the thrust at the top of the rocket, you would have very stable flight because the thrust would be lifting the rocket and the weight would hang below it. This works out if you're trying to hover, but if you're actually flying through the air, it doesn't work. And let's explore why. The first principle that we talked about with the center of balance and center of drag still applies. Now imagine the rocket is flying sideways. Gravity is pulling evenly on the entire rocket, so the whole thing wants to fall towards the ground. So what decides if it stays horizontal or not? Well that comes back to the center of drag and the center of balance. Now if there's more drag behind the balance point, then the rocket is going to fall nose first if it's falling through the air, which a rocket is basically always falling. But what if you reverse them? Well, that's what happened with Robert Goddard's rocket. Now it falls the opposite direction, which seems counterintuitive, but there's more weight behind the center of drag on the rocket, so it's gonna fall the wrong direction. So what happens when thrust is applied? It seems like the rocket would just wanna fly in the direction that it's pointing, but once it starts to travel through the air, the air is going to push the rocket around because it wants to travel fins first. Remember when it just fell through the air and the fins went first? That's what happens when it's traveling straight. So now that the rocket is traveling through the air, the fins are constantly trying to face the direction that the rocket is traveling, but the thrust is pushing it the opposite direction, and that's why the rocket starts to spin, or just turns around and smashes into the ground. So that's why this is called the pendulum fallacy, because yes, if a rocket was hovering, it would be held up by the lift because more weight is below it. But once it's traveling through the air, the aerodynamic forces overcome that pendulum force that you have with the thrust being above the center of weight. So when you have the thrust coming from the bottom, the only thing that's important to keep the rocket flying straight then is that the force of thrust is directed exactly through the center of gravity or the center balance point of the rocket when you look at it long ways. Then it's gonna push it straight. It's just like if you balanced it on the tip of your finger and with that thrust being lined up with the balance point, it's also very easy for the rocket to stay pointing the direction that it's supposed to because of the aerodynamics as it flies through the air. And that's also based off of where the center of gravity and the center of drag is at. See how this is piece by piece, but it all comes together? 
So a rocket at low speed has less stability than a rocket at high speed, typically. Which is something that matters for how this came out of the Iron Man fist, right? The gauntlet thing. In order to understand fully what was going on when the Hacksmith and I fired this, you have to see it in very slow motion. So watch this clip and we'll talk about what happened. When a rocket's moving through the air, it's always being pulled towards the ground. Now, if it's flying evenly horizontal, it takes the exact same amount of time for it to fall to the ground if you just drop it or if it's in flight. The difference is when you have it aerodynamically correct, it's going to nose towards the ground and the thrust is going to push in the direction that the nose is pointing so it goes to the ground faster. This matters because it should be coming out of the Iron Man launcher horizontally. But we can't actually have it come out horizontally because you see how fast it starts to head towards the ground because it's moving very slowly. So the faster the rocket is moving, the more level the flight appears to be. Now we can also make the flight appear more level if it doesn't come out horizontally. So to do that, we could tip the rocket up, but we could also utilize momentum to force the rocket to fly slightly more vertical when it comes out of the launcher. That way it levels off in flight and travels much farther horizontally around the area that we aimed it to shoot towards in the first place. When I was firing with the Hacksmith, it was still coming down like this, but the fins were so big that they were catching on the armor as it exited, and it pushed the tail of the rocket up, and that momentum in this direction carried into it and made it curve towards the ground even more than it did when the fins weren't catching the armor, and they cleared it. Guidance would be the easiest way to make this rocket fire where you're trying to shoot it to, but you have to remember that when that rocket's loaded inside the launch tube, you have very, very little area outside of the rocket motor to actually do anything to make this thing fly right. So even having expandable fins is difficult to accomplish. But if we utilize momentum, we can try to make this fly opposite than it did before. First of all, by angling it up. And if it's angled up, when it goes to exit the tube, instead of the fins springing open and pushing the back of the rocket up, it'll push the back of the rocket down slightly. And also, if the front of the rocket is angled up slightly when it fires, it'll already be on that path. So we'll be directing the momentum of the rocket the opposite direction than it was when I fired it before. Then the rocket will have the opportunity to come out, fly, and level off, and go towards where you aimed it. Now with those ideas, I just come up with a system that tries to make this come out and fly relatively straight. But there's one more thing that I can do to try to make this more efficient at flying straight and accurately. And that has to do with weight, because I have too much mass all over the entire rocket. And these are C65 Estes rocket engines. Now I'm going to break this rocket in half and show you why I'm not going to use these rockets anymore. <laughs> Here's the C65 motor that I was using in my rockets and you can see that it's full to capacity with propellant, delay, and ejection charge. There's the nozzle, completely full rocket motor. Here's a B62. This is the same size body, but look at how empty that is. You have far less weight because this has substantially less propellant, delay, and ejection charge in it compared to a C65, but the initial thrust of this is almost exactly the same. Here's a B60. Look at that. You can't even see it down in there. There's hardly anything inside this. It only has about that much because it just has thrust and then an ejection charge, but it has no clay cap on top of the ejection charge either because it's intended to light the next rocket motor for a dual stage rocket. Remember when we talked about the rocket being faster to have a perceived flatter flight? By using these rocket motors, I reduce the weight of the rocket. If the rocket weighs less but has nearly the same amount of thrust, it's going to leave the tube fast and fly fast and have a better flight profile. The nose cones that I used on the C6s were solid cast to offset the weight of the rocket motor. Now that I have lighter rocket motors, I can slush cast them and I can also optimize that. The old rockets were basically full before, but now that they're almost entirely empty and I have slush cast nose cones, I can add lead weight to the front of the nose cone and tune the balance but have an overall lighter weight within the rocket. This will help me get a better flight out of the rocket. But with the tube of the rocket motor being nearly empty, it also allows me the opportunity to put little springs in to make sure that the rocket is lifted up so that I get the angle that's necessary for it to exit the tube correctly. Now the next time somebody starts using big words when they talk about rocket science, they might not understand what they're talking about, but at least you understand what's actually going on 
even if you don't know the big words. But let's talk about what the big words are anyway. That way you can say them too to sound smart also. Astronautics, drogue, zenith, parsec, perihelion, apogee, aphelion, micrometeoroid, ephemeris, heliocentric, jansky, barycenter, eccentricity, perilune, chuffing, periapsis, apolune, perturbation, apoapsis, base drag, Lagrangian point, torus, perigee, magnetohydrodynamics, vector, precession, heliopause. If you want to come hang out with me, I'm going to be at the Maker Fair in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania on October 15th and 16th. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more awesome stuff. Next video, I'm shooting this thing and testing out the different designs of rocket that I've got to try to see if I can get it to fire straight and accurately. Back from the dead. Do I look like I work for NASA? I don't even know if rocket scientists wear lab coats. I feel like they wear these kinds of glasses though. So.